Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Yolo County uh, Judicial Candidates Forum. My name is David Greenwald. I am the Executive Director of the Davis Vanguard, and uh, we, along with Davis Media Access, who are supplying the uh, cameras uh, and recording this uh, to be played at a later date, um, are the co-sponsors of this event. I'd like to thank each of the four candidates uh, who are here this evening uh, to replace a seat uh, that is vacated by Judge uh, Mock, uh, who's in the audience today as well. Um, so I want to briefly lay out the rules of uh, this uh, candidates forum. So each can candidate is going to be given two minutes to give an opening statement. Um, then each candidate will read one question. The other three candidates will have two minutes each to answer the question. And then uh, they will answer their own question last. And then we will rotate to the next candidate. So those will be four questions. Then we have developed our own questions. Uh, one is in three parts, which will be one minute each. And then the others will be in two minute intervals. And I will be keeping time and I will rudely uh, cut you off uh, when the time goes up because we have very tight timeline. When we are done with those questions, uh, we will take a five minute break. And then we will have about 20 to 30 minutes for audience questions. Uh, there should be cards in the audience. Those are the questions. Uh, you will submit those questions uh, to uh, Matt, who is hiding back there, um, or another volunteer who comes around and, and beckons for them. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like uh, to introduce Janine Baronio, uh, who will uh, give two minutes um, opening speech. I'm Janine Baronio. Is it working? Okay. And I'm Yolo Superior Court Commissioner. I've been a commissioner for the last 25 years. Prior to that, I was with the Yolo County District Attorney's Office. While I was with the District Attorney's Office, I did an extensive amount of felony jury trials. I also supervised both the Davis and the Broderick branch offices. And as a commissioner, I've been doing the work of a judge for the last 25 years, I was appointed by the judges to do this job. I'm an at-will employee who has to keep the judges happy, and I've done that for 25 years. Hi, my name is Rick Cohen. As a family law specialist, I have devoted my life to protecting children and families. Currently, we have no family law attorneys on the bench, and we need someone with the experience, skill, and fortitude of a family law specialist to be our next judge. I am humbled and proud to be endorsed by State Senators Daryl Steinberg and Mark Leno, Assemblymember Roger Dickinson, Davis City Council Member Brett Lee, West Sacramento City Council Members Mark Johannesson and Bill Kristoff, and Winter City Council Member Woody Friday. I am especially proud that just this past Monday, I was unanimously endorsed by the Democratic Party. I earned my law degree at UC Davis in 1989 and I'm a proud Aggie. Yolo County feel with the words education, industry, agriculture, truly defines us. We have a broad and diverse community, yet with all of our differences and individual community needs, we have a very important connection that brings us together, our families, our children, and our seniors. Family law touches upon the lives of all of us, from divorce domestic to domestic violence, just about every one of us in this room has had their lives affected by family law. Nothing stops a bullet like a job, and nothing strengthens our community by protecting children at the beginning and making sure that they are on the right path. We as a community need to invest in our children and our future. Finally, I want to say thank you to the Davis Vanguard, to the Davis residents, and to my fellow candidates. All of you work so very hard to ensure that our community elect people who share our values, support our school, treasure the beauty of our natural environment, and zealously protect the civil rights of our entire society. 
thank you for taking the time to ensure that our voices are heard. <laughs> Hello, good evening. My name is John Brennan. Um, I have my background. I was 10 years as a prosecutor in various different counties. Sacramento uh, was the last county I practiced in as a prosecutor. For the last 10 years, I've been in private practice running my own, oh, excuse me, nine years. I've been in private practice running my own business, doing a wide variety of cases throughout the state of California, uh, mainly the northern state. My primary practice is devoted to uh, Sacramento County and Yolo County. Um, I'm a father. I have five children. My wife is a deputy district attorney in Sacramento. We live in West Sacramento, and uh, that's about it for my qualifications. Good evening, and thank you for being here this evening. My name is Lorenda Delaini, and I'm a deputy attorney general and a Yolo, Yolo County native. In terms of my experience, I spent nearly five years as a deputy district attorney in both Contra Costa and Sacramento counties. When I had that position, I had the pleasure of working in nearly every capacity in the office that you could imagine. I worked in the misdemeanor intake unit where I was responsible for filing misdemeanor cases. I worked in a general misdemeanor unit. I also worked in domestic violence. I prosecuted cases at juvenile hall. I worked in our general felony team where I handled serious cases such as vehicular manslaughter, residential burglary, and robbery. I also worked in the felony settlement courts. While I was at the district attorney's office, I was honored by the district attorney with the Victim Service Award for my commitment to justice and for the compassion and respect that I showed towards victims and their families. When I left the district attorney's office, I started at the California Attorney General's office. I'm currently in the criminal division. I work in the appeals, writs, and trial section, and that position has given me experience that is completely unmatched by any other person, or excuse me, any other candidate. I respond to direct criminal appeals that are filed by defendants in cases. I also have the honor of handling people's appeals for our office. There's me and two other individuals. So anytime a district attorney's office in one of the 30 counties that we represent, has an issue, they bring it to our attention and we do the research and do the evaluation to see if we will handle an appeal. I am also the coordinator for the 4900 claims for our office, which are erroneously convicted offender claims. So I investigate those cases and also assign them out to others. Thank you. And thank you everybody for uh, adhering to the timeline. Uh, we're gonna start uh, with uh, Janine Baronio asking the first question and Rick Cohen will be the first one to answer it. If you guys could pass the mic down. The question is, the job of a judge is quite different than the job of a lawyer and an advocate. What have you done to prepare yourself to make the transition from being an advocate for clients to being a neutral, fair, and impartial judge? Thank you, Janine. That's a terrific question. For the last 17 years, I have been serving as a temporary judge in the state of California, both in Placer County, Sacramento County. I have served as a temporary judge trying family law cases, handling law and motion hearings, conducting settlement conferences, small claims court, serving as a judicial arbitrator, serving as a fee arbitrator for the County Bar Association. And so as a result, what I've learned is how to listen, how to receive evidence, how to make findings of facts, apply the facts to the law fairly, impartially, and accurately. Thank you. For the last 20 years, I have been in court on an almost daily basis. I think the experience of being a prosecutor and being a private defense attorney give me the qualifications that frankly no other kind of candidate has. I started off my career looking at the case from the side of law enforcement, from the side of reading the police reports, um, getting all my facts and information based solely from what the police officers had told me. For the last nine years, I've been on the other side of that. I get the police reports now, but it's also my job to look further, going deeper, look at what the evidence shows, talk to the witnesses, talk to the victims. And so there's always 
multiple sides to every story. So I believe the last 20 years of my career has given me the ability to do that, to be fair and impartial, to look at the facts, look at what the evidence shows. Thank you. In the last 10 years in my career, I've been responsible for a number of positions that don't necessarily involve being an advocate for any of the parties involved. Um, at the district attorney's office in Contra Costa County, I was on the filing desk, and that isn't necessarily in the role of an advocate. It's looking at the police reports, seeing what the evidence shows, and trying to make a determination as to the, whether the evidence presented can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that individual is guilty of the offense and making that filing determination. One of my responsibilities at the attorney general's office concerns erroneously convicted offender claims, and I'm not an advocate in that role either. We do the investigation, we talk to defendants, we talk to victims, we talk to the law enforcement agencies who were involved in the arrest and the conviction, and we make an impartial determination as to whether that individual is entitled to, entitled to relief under our penal codes. Another thing that gives me experience in being um, an impartial individual and something other than an advocate is my experience in the community and the involvement that I have um, in various organizations working with children, working with parolees, and trying to get them um, back where they should be so that they're more productive. And then also as a mother, I handle disputes every single day. My children are constantly fighting. They're four and seven years old and the disputes to them are of uh, monumental uh, capacity. And I give them an opportunity to be heard. I listen to them and I have the ability to make a decision after I've heard from both of them. Could you pass it back to uh, Mr. Cohen? So uh, Mr. Cohen, you now read the question and oh thank you i haven't been an advocate for 25 years i've been sitting on the bench as an impartial judicial officer for 25 years i don't have a learning curve i've been doing it i've been to judges college and i've taken all the continuing education for all these years i practiced the art of judging. I've taken classes in the art of judging. I've been doing it. Now, Mr. Cohen, your turn. Please describe your volunteer work that demonstrates your commitment to public service. As I mentioned, I'm self-employed and I'm the father of five children. My public service is taking care of my children. It doesn't leave much time when you have uh, three kids under six years old in the house. Um, we are very involved in my uh, daughter's school. We were put on, my wife uh, and uh, basically a group of us from the school put on a fundraiser last night. Uh, it was the last thing we did uh, for Holy Cross School in West Sacramento. Um, some of the, we we're very successful in that since we've started in that school. We've very, been very involved in generating funds for that school to provide uh, the latest thing was playground equipment. The time before was uh, the first fundraiser was for scholarships for the underprivileged schools, uh, children in that community. But um, besides helping out with my kids and their sports events, I do not unfortunately have a lot of time for public service. Thank you. <laughs> For a number of years, I have made community service a priority of mine. While I was in law school, I volunteered at Big Brothers Big Sisters, where I mentored a child for nearly four years whose mother was incarcerated and her father was not in her life. I also volunteered during the same time at the Student Buddy Program, Communities in Schools, which is another program that tries to mentor disadvantaged children and help them see a better future. I've also volunteered at VIP Mentors, which is Volunteers in Parole, where I mentored a parolee who is now off parole. She's doing very well and she's got a wonderful job. I also am very active at my daughter's school. My daughter attends St. James School. Last year I chaired their auction where we made over $100,000 for their school. 
This year, I chaired the Davis business donations for that auction, so I was responsible for soliciting all of the businesses in Davis to make donations of either money or items for our, um, for our auction. I also teach over at Sacramento Community College, where I give back to my community. I teach criminal procedure, the legal aspects of evidence, and for nearly eight years, I taught the basic concepts of criminal law. I also work at Lincoln Law School in the first year writing program, trying to help their students along the way to make sure that they obtain effective legal writing skills. In addition to that, my husband is very active in our community. He coaches soccer teams for both our son and our daughter. He coaches a t-ball team for our son. He works in law enforcement, and he is a combat Gulf War veteran. Okay, pass it back. I've served on the Law Library Board of Trustees for Yolo County. I've been both the president and the secretary. I've donated my time to the University of California at Davis Law School in their moot court competition, their trial practice, and their Francis Carr competition. Probably what I'm proudest of, though, is participating in the Every 15 Minute program, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but that's a program put on at the local high schools by law enforcement and they put together a car crash from a drunk driver. And volunteers from every walk of life come there and they get cars, they, they uh, paint the kids up with the, the eye coming out or the cuts or the bruises. They get them involved in um, going to the jail if you're the defendant who was driving the car the person who died in the injury goes to the morgue and actually gets zipped up in the body bag. So all the children that participate in this really understand how important this is, but then so do all the other children who are in the uh, school who every 15 minutes someone comes in and takes a child out of the class showing that every 15 minutes someone dies from a drunk driving accident. So that's probably the public service I'm proudest of. And Mr. Cohen, answer your own question. Thank you. My volunteer commitment really can fall into three categories, teaching, public, and the court. For the past 17 years, I regularly present the continuing education program to young lawyers, to mental health providers, to experienced <coughs> attorneys, everything from how to be a lawyer, the presentation of evidence, the opposition, to addressing how to handle custody disputes. With respect to the service to the public, I've twice on two different occasions been on the board of directors of the Alzheimer's Association, Greater Sacramento Area Chapter. I have also been on the board of the University of Michigan Alumni Association, and I've been on the advisory commission of the Voluntary Legal Services Program of Northern California, which is a pro bono organization dedicated to providing legal services to the indigent. In terms of service to the court and to the community, I am on the board of directors of the statewide association of certified family law specialists. I'm the vice chair and the, on the executive committee of the family law section of the Sacramento County Bar Association. I'm the previous vice chair of the children's law section. I have, in addition to the pro tem work previously done, I'm sorry. <coughs> I also have taught at UC Davis the moot court program in terms of providing the input and judging the mock trial program, both at the Francis Newell Co competition and at the high school annual statewide mock trial competition. I am very proud to be able to give back to the community, to the children and families that we care about. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brennan, it is your turn to ask the question. Which process for selecting a judge politicizes a candidate more, a political race or an impartial commission that vets candidates for their qualifications and temperament, including checking references with those who know them and their history in the legal community? Given my brief experience in the last two months of this process, I would have to say that selecting 
a judge through the election process is one that has the chance of politicizing a party more. Uh, when you have individuals from the bench or from the uh, community, the legal community who are getting involved in the process, um, it does turn very political. Um, so I'd have to say that that is the process that has an opportunity to do it more rather than having an impartial commission together who can interview individuals um, and they can give their best assessment that might be confidential and they can sit down and interview that individual and also interview the uh, candidates to go over what has been said with them and see if they've learned any insight from the critiques or criticism. A campaign clearly politic politicizes a campaign a candidate more, although there is political um, indications for the commission because you do have to get support from political areas and so forth. But clearly, um, doing a campaign like this is much more difficult and politicizes the candidate much more. They're both political. Let's be completely honest. A governor who makes an appointment frequently, but not always, appoints someone in that same governor political party or rewards an employee who's worked in the governor's office for services rendered. <coughs> an election is political. We're lining up people on our side. They're lining up people on their side. People associate with the values we have. And often, those line up with political parties because Democrats tend to believe in one way, Republicans tend to believe in another way, Green parties believe in a third way, etc. So it's completely political. The issue, however, is in this situation, we're proud that we have an open election and the opportunity for the people to make their choices, for the people to get to know the candidates, and for the people to decide who among the candidates best represents their values, what they care about, and whether they have that sense that that candidate is the one that's going to look after the children, the families, and serve with honor and distinction. Thank you. I would have to agree with Mr. Cohen or all, all the uh, candidates here. Clearly, running a race or a political campaign is, is going to bring out the issues and make it much more uh, of a political race. Um, I do agree with Ms. Cohen that still even the appointment is very political because you'll see a uh, governor is coming to the end of his term, a lot of uh, you know, promises or, or paybacks maybe for services rendered or for being dedicated um, person for that governor, um, you'll see a lot of repayment for that. Um, with the, this po uh, process where you're going around and at least introducing yourself, meeting the people, it is political still, um, unfortunately. Uh, I don't believe it should be. The, it's supposed to be, obviously, a nonpartisan race. It shouldn't matter what your political affiliation is. But as Mr. Cohen points out, that you know, it seems that only Democrats will talk to Democrats and only Republicans will talk to Republicans, no matter what, or no matter the fact this is supposed to be a nonpartisan race. So, you know, I, I didn't, this wasn't quite the question I had asked, but uh, this is how it came out. And I, I think clearly this, this process is much more political. Hey, Ms. Delaini. Thank you. Do you think knowledge of or involvement in the Yolo County community is important to being a good judge? Uh, no. Uh, I absolutely think it's important to being a good judge, and I think more important than that is knowledge of the Yolo Superior Court. I've been working for the Yolo Superior Court for 25 years. I know the judges, I know the staff, and I know the attorneys, and I'm well respected. <coughs> Knowing the community is very, very important because you need to know the history, you need to know the customs, you need to know how the court works. Um, I've developed forms that the court uses. It's extremely important 
to know the, the community and to know the court. If you remember when I made my introduction remarks, I talked about the Yolo County feel with the words industry, agriculture, and education. Those are the heart of what is and what is fabulous about Yolo County. As a UCD law grad, I'm a proud Aggie, and I regularly represent people from the university, professors, administrative assistants, occasionally students. For agriculture, by having represented farmers, previously I represented people who owned land right next to the Yolo Bypass, and they had an epic battle against the city of Davis over flooding problem caused by the development of the Mace Ranch subdivision. By representing the farmers, I learned more about farming in several years than I did in the lifetime. Soybean, tomato, alfalfa, when they grow, what crops the winter crop, summer crop. Industry, I represented business owners who have dealt with contract problems, <coughs> bankruptcy issues that are going to adversary proceedings in federal court, even the sale of businesses and the corporate transactions involved, and most importantly, the people of Yellow County, Woodland, Davis, Winters, West Sacramento, they all care about their community, and working with them has been one of the greatest privileges that I've had. Thank you. I absolutely think being part of the community is important to be a fair judge. Um, last two weeks, I've done a trial in front of Judge Mock that is uh, clearly one of the hot button topics in our community. Nowadays, it's a, a gang case, specifically a Broderick Boy uh, gang case. Um, I spent years as a gang prosecutor uh, in the DA's office and various DA's offices. So being involved in the community and specifically living in the Broderick area, I'm familiar with these issues that we're facing. Uh, the criminal justice system has gone through a radical change in the last couple of years. And I think uh, being on top of that and involved in the community is something that 90% of the, of the judge's time is going to be spent on in this, in this community. So, thank you. All right, last question. Absolutely, living in this community and being aware of the issues that face the members of this community is critical to the role of being a judge. I grew up in Yolo County. I graduated from River City High School. I was educated in our public schools. My husband is also from Yolo County and was educated in our public schools. We have served this community and through law enforcement for more than the last 20 years and as a veteran where he has served our country. Living in the community, living with the people that you are going to be serving, listening to those individuals and sharing in their interests gives you that accountability that you need or the greater accountability to make sure that we are fair and impartial when we are sitting on the bench. Okay, very good. Um, you guys did an amazing job of staying within the time constraints. Uh, we're gonna make it a little bit more difficult this, uh, this go around because we're gonna reduce it to a minute. Um, I had uh, some requests in the back uh, to speak up a little bit more because they're having trouble hearing you guys. Uh, so if you could project a little bit more. Um, so uh, we're going to start uh, this round uh, with Mr. Cohen. Um, I'm going to read the question and uh, each of you will have one minute to answer these questions. So the question is, since you all believe that knowledge of or involvement in the Yolo County community is important to being a good judge, how much experience do you have working in the Yolo County Superior Courtrooms? Thank you. I've been practicing law for nearly 25 years now. One of my first cases in my first trial, I was proud to be in Yolo County before Judge Donna Petrie, and it was the case on the contract to make a will where people had years ago sold their shares of stock to their father in return for the promise they would get the shares back when their father passed away. And sure enough, he cut them out of the will. And that went all the way to the Court of Appeals. As I said, I've represented farmers. I've represented families, children, people dealing with issues where people have died prematurely, dealing with the issues of <coughs> sanctions, divorce, custody. All of those things have been in the other county. I'm delighted when I've walked up the stairs to the courthouse 
and I'm even more <laughs> delighted in the current family law department because the acoustics are much better, and so the result is an easier courtroom to work with. We have the new courthouse coming up. It'll be ready in 2015. All right, and I've got to cut you off. All right, Mr. Brennan. <coughs> Since, uh, well, up until 2005, I was a deputy district attorney in various counties, so going up until that point, I was never a DA in Yolo County. Starting in 2005, I started private practice, and since then, I've been in Yolo County uh, on various, numerous different cases. I've done trials up there. As I said, I just completed a two-week trial um, that went to jury on Friday in front of Judge Mock. I've done other trials in front of Judge Fall, um, had one of my very first um, appearances in Yellow County was a DUI arraignment in front of the Commissioner Peronio. Um, that was back early 2005. So since 2005 I've done some family law stuff up there, one or two cases, not very many. Uh, but uh, I would say, it's hard to say, I'm not up there on a daily basis, majority of my practice is out of Sacramento, but between Sacramento and Yellow County are my two primary areas of where I practice in California. The district attorney's office, most of my practice has been beyond the superior courts. My practice is typically in the California Courts of Appeal, the California Supreme Court, the United States District Court, and the United States Court of Appeal for the Ninth Circuit. The practice that I've had for nearly, well, just over five years now involving the Yolo County Superior Court has been in handling appeals from convictions that come out of that court. And as I mentioned earlier, one of my specialties in the office is handling people's appeals and I get a number of people's appeals from the Yolo County Superior Court. I've had three that were handled successfully since probably November or December of uh, 2013, and so that is kind of my involvement with the Yolo so County Superior Courts at this time. It's looking at the evidence that has been received, the decision that has been made by the judge in that particular case, and the parties involved, and trying to defend that or conceding the rightfulness or wrongfulness of that decision on appeal. From my first day in the deputy di in the district attorney's office as a deputy district attorney till the day I quit working, every single day has been in a Yolo County court. I started when we had municipal courts, and now we only have superior courts. 34 years only in Yolo County. All right, that is question number one. Um, and I want to remind the audience to fill out your cards. If you have questions, Matt will come around the room, and also I'm going to uh, deputize uh, Kathy to do some uh, as well. Come around and pick up uh, and Cecilia and Antoinette. So uh, you'll be covered on all four corners. Uh, if you have questions, uh, which will be coming up uh, after the break. Uh, so the second question will be for Mr. Brennan. Um, and then everybody else, obviously, uh, one minute. Uh, since you all believe that knowledge of or involvement in the Yolo County community is important to being a good judge, please name the top three groups, in your opinion. Oh, uh oh. My operator error. <laughs> That's the next one. Sorry. So I'm okay? You're all right. Okay, I'm just going to do the question. Uh, please name the top three groups, in your opinion, that currently promote further access to justice in the Yolo County community. Uh, Mr. Brennan, one minute. Well, I would, I guess, say the Public Defender's Office, first of all, if we're talking about the criminal aspect of it and we're talking about justice. Uh, the panel up there, the Indigent Defense Panel, um, would be the second, and then the Yolo Bar Association would be the third, in my opinion. 90%, um, I believe, of all the cases handled in the Superior Court are criminal cases. The Public Defender's Office has a, a, a very tough job in, in representing the clients and ensuring access to them, uh, make sure they get fair and partial treatment. Same with the conflict panel they have up there. They have some great attorneys on that um, that are always available and willing to, to you know, take the cases 
And then the Yola Bar, the private attorneys who are out there um, taking the cases and, and making sure clients have uh, their rights protected and make sure they're not being overrun or just doing what the police officers think. So those would be, in my opinion, the top three in Yolo County. All right, uh, go ahead. The top three groups in um, our county that promote and further access to justice are obviously the courts. Um, because that is where justice is served in our community. It's the public defender's office and the DA's office, but both of those following under the larger umbrella of the California State Bar, where we can contribute to things like access to justice and where we have our professional responsibility as attorneys to contribute to and promote access to justice for those individuals in our community who may not otherwise have it. Okay. Back to Ms. Baronio. I think the attorneys, uh, the DA and the public defender, I'm going to lump them into one. I think victims' rights groups also are very, very important in bringing uh, equal access because victims need that representation. And so without the victims' rights group, you don't have that. And then the third group would be the bar itself. <coughs> First, we need to pay attention to the people who watch the people, and that's the Davis Vanguard and the Vanguard Court Project. They keep an eye out and make sure that nothing slips through undetected, and that's extremely important for ensuring access to justice. Second, we have the Family Justice Center project that's underway, and we need to support the program to help protect children and families, provide training, education, services for victims of domestic violence, and third, we should thank the University of California Davis Law School and their clinical program, their domestic violence clinics. They provide support services. They get active and involved in the community, and they make sure people are helped when they need help. Thank you. All right. And then the third part of this question goes to Ms. Delaini. Uh, since you all believe that knowledge of involvement in Yolo County community is important to being a good judge, what responsibility do you think a judge has to be involved in the community after he, she is elected? I think that judges have a tremendous responsibility to still be active and involved in our community um, long after taking the bench. And I've proven that through my uh, community service that I would be an individual who would continue on that. It's just important for our judges to be out there and to be accessible so that it kind of takes the mystery out of the process for individuals who are going to be appearing before them um, in their courtrooms. I agree that it's very important to be involved in the community. You have to be a little more careful once you become a judge, though, because you have to choose your uh, activities more wisely. You can't get involved in the same groups that you may have been involved with before. Uh, that's why the Board of Trustees works for the law library. That's why every 15 minutes worked. And that's why uh, anything that has to do with criminal justice has to work. Anything that has to do with the courts, you can do that. A judge, but not only a judge, all of us have a duty and an obligation to be a part of our community, to be active and involved. We all have a different skill sets and strengths, and we should choose those activities, choose how we serve in a way that meets the community and meets our skill set, whether that coaching Little League, whether that is working with high school students, whether that is being involved and active in committees. Each of us have a duty, and each of us should actively be involved. Thank you. Um, I obviously agree that, you're, that if you're elected, uh, you should be involved in the community. Obviously, as I stated, I live in the community. I live in West Sacramento, raising my children in West Sacramento. They're attending school in West Sacramento. 
Um, we are involved in functions in West Sacramento. Again, Yellow County is a unique county. It's different than Sacramento or the surrounding counties. Um, and I think being part of it and out there on a daily basis, living in the community, you get to know what the hot button topics are, what the issues are affecting this county. So I do believe it's important. And I think obviously I will be plan on raising my family and living in Sacramento, West Sacramento for as long as we can, so. All right, we're gonna go back uh, to Ms. Baronio. Uh, we're back to the two minute questions. Uh, we got three more in this round and then we're gonna take our break. Um, you guys are doing great in terms of time. So uh, uh, everybody out there, that means you're gonna get more questions to ask. So uh, make sure you write down uh, on your note cards. Um, so this, um, this goes to Ms. Baronio first. How does a judicial candidate and an elected judge avoid getting too close to your constituents so that you can be fair and impartial? That's probably one of the hardest things when you take the bench is having to change some of your relationships in order that you can do that. Um, you have to choose wisely where you go, what you do, and what who you do it with. You can't um, ever say what your opinion is about certain things. You have to be very careful what you do, what you say, and that's the only way you can do that. We have 200,000 people in this county. I can have 50 friends. But ultimately, when you're in the community and when you are providing public service, you do need to be mindful of your role and you need to be mindful of where those relationships are. One of the important things is to know that if there's someone that you know personally appears before you, you need to disqualify yourself. Not only because there's an issue whether you are fair, but because of the perception or the appearance of whether you can be fair. And it's important that the judge be intellectually honest and be able to say, I know this person, and even though I'm sure I can be fair, I trust myself. The issue is, does the other side worry that you're going to be unfair? As a result, you need to be careful about who you are friends with, but that doesn't mean you can't be part of the community. We all are part of the community, and it's a matter of knowing who you know and being sure you're careful when they appear before you and they can't appear before you. Obviously, there's strict rules for, for uh, disclosures and, and who you have to uh, declare either a conflict on or, or inform both sides if you know this person, et cetera. Um, the being fair and impartial, to me, it seems I'm part of the IDP Indigent Defense Panel board member in Sacramento. One of the committees or one of the boards I'm on is the peer review committee. So we evaluate uh, attorneys in Sacramento County that have had complaints made about them. And we will make recommendations as to possible um, suspension uh, from the panel, not from the bar, uh, to continue an education, to uh, providing a mentor for some attorneys who need it. And I've been part of that uh, since 2006, I wanna say. And I've been doing that. I've been mentored to some of the younger attorneys that are not quite the qualified levels for a case if a case is upgraded. Um, I've also had to discipline and had to uh, kick people off the panel, some of my friends. Uh, we went to a major reclassification about four or five years ago, and a lot of people that I'd known for many years were, were not approved at the level they wanted to be approved at. They did not, uh, some of them weren't asked to come back, and it was a very hard thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. And the, I believe I could bring that to the bench because I've been doing it for the last eight years or so. Thank you. When you're a person who has the ability to be fair and impartial, it's part of your character. It's who you are. And so it's kind of ingrained in you to make sure that you don't step over the line and that you keep those relationships where they're supposed to be. 
there are judicial canons and rules of professional responsibility that would guide me along the way. If an individual came um, before my court, either as a defendant um, or as an attorney on one side or the other, I would be able to follow those judicial canons and make sure that I made the right decision whether I needed to recuse myself or to make sure that there would be no appearance of impropriety in that courtroom because being fair and impartial and having that integrity is part of my character. Okay, um, and, and maybe if you guys have your questions ready, um, some of the volunteers can go around and pick them up from the audience um, so that we can evaluate them and make sure that they pass judicial muster. Um, so, uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, has a complaint ever been filed against you with the Commission on Judicial Performance or with the State Bar? If so, what did it concern? <coughs> Did you file a response, and what was the resolution? No, no, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable. <laughs> and I don't need two minutes to answer that question, I'm sorry. Well, obviously, the Commission of Judicial Performance, I have no complaints filed against me. Uh, in my nine years as a private attorney, I had uh, two clients do what's called a fee dispute. Um, with the state bar, it went to arbitration, and I was actually awarded the unpaid sum of money that they never paid me, and it was called for in the contract, which I never got anyway. Um, I did file a response because we were mandated to, and uh, again, like I said, at arbitration, I won the outstanding balance, but never sought to collect it or never tried to enforce the judgment. There were clearly clients that weren't happy that entered a plea, both of them entered a plea. Um, to multiple, multiple years in state prison. And uh, I guess they had buyer's remorse. So those are it for me. No, sir. I had a complaint filed by the father of a defendant that I put in jail because I was supposed to put him in jail, and it was found to be unfounded. Okay, um, so this is the final question in this round. It'll be Mr. Brennan uh, answering first. Have you ever submitted your name to be considered for a judge before? If so, why do you believe you were not selected? What was the commission's findings? If you have not submitted your name to be judged before, why not? I have never submitted my name uh, to the Jenny Commission or any, well, the Jenny Commission is the board that uh, qualifies the judges, or excuse me, candidates onto the governor's office. I have never done that. Uh, why haven't I done that? I feel like finally in my career, I'm 20 years of experience has given me the ability or the, um, the ability to be a fair and impartial judge and have the experience needed to be a judge. The qualifications say you need 10 years, but frankly, my views 10 years ago as coming straight out of a prosecutor's office are much different than they are now. I think I'm much more of a well-balanced person now. Um, and my intention was to do it. I was planning on waiting, maybe my kids were a bit older. Once there was an open seat, that came up when Judge Mock decided not to or put his name in or retire and have the governor appoint uh, somebody. Um, that's when I decided now is the time to do it because it's a, it hasn't happened in my 19 years as, a, as or 20 years as a pra practicing attorney. I've never seen an open judicial seat happen. So that's why I decided to jump in now. I have never submitted my name. Um, for consideration to be a judge before it was had some it was something that my husband and I had considered 
um, and would not have done it probably at this time had I not had such strong feelings about my community. At the time I got involved in this race, it was just Ms. Baronio and Mr. Cohen involved, neither of which live in our community. Um, and so that's why I got involved in this race now at this time. I felt that it was important for our community to have a strong voice, to have somebody who is from this community, who is a native of this community, and who has served this community to be involved. Yes, I have submitted my name before. Um, I'm, not, I'm not very politically connected. I don't have any uh, connections to get myself a political appointment. And I actually really like the person that got selected. I have submitted an application for a judicial appointment. I cannot speak for the governor to his reasons for selecting other people. But what we do know is that many, many people submit their applications. There are many qualified people. But one of the problems is that family lawyers do not get the respect they deserve. We practice in one of, if not the most difficult areas of the law, requiring us to know not just issues of property, custody, support, but we have to know and be familiar with taxation, immigration, bankruptcy, criminal law. And people tend not to recognize that. But ultimately, the governor makes his choices, which include political favors, which include its employees and people in the governor's office, prosecutors. And that is the governor's prerogative. And I'm very proud that we have a society that gives the governor that prerogative. And here, Today, we have the prerogative that the people get to choose. And the people will leave this room, and people will go to the polls, and they will ask themselves, who best meets their needs? Who protects children and families? Who looks out for their values? And that's where the people will make that choice. Thank you. OK, we're going to take a little break. We've got a lot of questions in, so we've got to go through those. Uh, we'll reconvene in a few minutes. I'll let you know when. Thanks. Okay, um, so we, we have a request that you kind of lean in and speak loud into the mic uh, because the people in the back are having a little trouble hearing. Um, so welcome back. Um, thank you for all your great questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to ask all of them. Uh, by agreement, because this is a judicial race, there are some questions that candidates can't answer. Um, and so by agreement, um, I have adopted the single objection system, which means that if any one of them objects, I'm simply going to move on rather than trying to sort through it. So hopefully uh, we can get through most of these questions. They're going to be one minute apiece. Um, we are going to be starting... Uh, it, it might help to explain to the audience why. <laughs> Basically, the, the judicial canon or rule that says that judges are not allowed to address issues that would commit them to a position that might come before them or to the court. So if you ask a question where we might have to answer in a way that somebody might have a dispute or a case, and by having been on record saying we support a certain position, that would suggest that we're no longer impartial or no longer biased. Similarly, we can't even talk about a case that's on the Court of Appeal or has come down recently. So if you heard, gee, the Court of Appeal just issued a decision on X, we can't talk about it because there's a specific rule that prohibits it. So it's not a question of ducking the question. All right. So uh, let us uh, begin. Uh, Ms. Delaini. Um, you get the first question. This one's actually specifically to you. Um, so the others can kind of decide if they uh, need to uh, respond to. Uh, your husband has been a Davis police officer and now a West Sacramento police officer. Isn't there an appearance of conflict of interest in every case where an officer from those agencies is a witness? There's absolutely not. I have the ability to be fair and impartial. Could I sit on a case where my husband is one of the witnesses? Absolutely not. Although I know I could be fair and impartial even if he were the witness, that would create an appearance of impropriety and that wouldn't be something that our judiciary needs. 
So there's not a concern with me sitting on a case where one of the officers from the Davis Police Department or the West Sacramento Police Department is testifying. Okay, uh, Ms. Baronia, did you wanna answer that more generally or it's up to you? Whether you think there's a conflict there or whether you have conflicts in your own life or. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a conflict in the past because my husband was a Davis police officer until he was injured in the line of duty and had to retire. And I would never hear his cases. There may be some conflicts based on West Sac, not from Davis anymore though. She's been gone from Davis long enough. The first issue is about disclosure. Letting the party to the case know that there is an issue out there. For example, Judge Mock's wife is a retired chief deputy of the Yolo County DA's office. So when he had criminal cases, and regularly had criminal cases, he would disclose that his wife is a prosecutor. Then most people would say, that's fine, we trust you. So it's a matter of making sure that you have your eye open for the potentials and making sure that the people are aware of it. Sometimes the conflict is great because they've had actual involvement in the case, and that's absolute <laughs> disqualification but if they have had nothing to do with it and it's just that they're in that office or that with the arresting agency, disclosure I think is what you need. I would agree with uh, all these folks that I, I don't think it's a big conflict. Um, my wife's a deputy district attorney in Sacramento. Obviously she can't prosecute a case I'm defending. Uh, you build you know, safeguards in place. The only, I guess, issue would be depending on the rank or if you're supervising as long as there's a, a disclosure and that she would conflict herself, there wouldn't be any type of um, bias or any type of problem, in my opinion. All right, next question, we'll go back to Baronio. All right, this is an interesting one. Are you in favor of trials being televised, filmed, and played later on TV so taxpayers and citizens can see how justice is dispensed in Yolo County? The only problem I would have with that is if the taping of the court procedure made for the procedure not to be fair. I think that happens quite often when everything's on television, you're not worried about the rights of the victim, the rights of the defendant, you're more worried about how good you're gonna look on TV. So if that's what's happening, no, it's a terrible idea. But if it can be done in a way where it doesn't affect the process and the fairness, then it's fine. No, I don't believe the trial should be televised because what happened is people start grandstanding. Judges start grandstanding. We start with the OJ trial, prosecutors, defense attorneys, plaintiff counsel, defense counsel, they all start playing to the camera instead of dealing with truth and justice and trying to see what's really going on and having to try as a fact, make an intelligent decision. The print media, on the other hand, people tend not to grandstand or play through the print media, so our trials, our proceedings are reported as they should be. I don't believe, with the exception of children, that courtrooms should be closed. I don't believe we should have locked doors in high-profile cases or low-profile cases. The court system, Access should be public, but we want to avoid grandstanding because that gets in the way of justice. As you all know or should know, obviously the courts are open in, except for the juvenile system or at certain specific instances, the courtroom can be closed. Uh, and I think the public has great access to the courtroom. You can walk into any courtroom, any county, any time. I would agree uh, that I don't believe they should be televised just for the fact I think some people will grandstand, some people will try to show off, but also I think in, in some of the serious cases that are done, the murders, the homicide, the gang cases that I've done, you'll get witnesses and people acting differently. And I'd have a, a concern that some of the potential witnesses to the case would be afraid. Um, for example, I do trials all the time and you're comfortable in that avenue, in that aspect. You put cameras in front of me up here and it's, it's a different world. Um, and I think that's going to affect the people out there. 
and, and my concern would be more for the witnesses or the potential repercussions for them if they're broadcasted. Thank you. If there was an opportunity that we could televise the trials without impairing the rights of any of the parties involved, whether that's the defendant, any of the witnesses who might be testifying, um, particularly witnesses if it's a sex offense, a child sex offense, or maybe even domestic violence, some sort of serious offense. There are, of course, many benefits of having a public trial. I'm not sure if those would be furthered by having our trials televised. Having our courtrooms open to the public causes the parties to perform better. There are also other benefits that come along with it. There could also be detriment, though, and we wouldn't want to prevent a defendant from taking his case to trial if he truly believed in his innocence because he had fear maybe of embarrassment or humiliation of what the public may find out. Um, there could also be tremendous safety issues for some of the witnesses involved, depending on what the type of offense is. If it's a gang offense or a serious or violent offense, there might be safety issues. There could also be issues for a defendant if identification is an issue in the case. You wouldn't want to have it televised if that's the main defense. All right. Um, Mr. Cohen, I think it's your question. What ideas do you have to improve the quality of jury pools? <laughs> Our jury pools are good, contrary to what a lot of people say. Our juries are made out of people just like us. They receive that wonderful or dreaded little envelope in the mail, and they do their one day, one trial. They are people who are everywhere from day laborers to university professors, professionals, teachers, unemployed people. And what I hear constantly over my nearly quarter century of being a lawyer is how much, how often the jury get it right. So I'm happy and proud of our jury system. It's part of what makes our government and our country terrific. Thank you. Which way, Dave? Um, you. I think uh, the jury panel in Yolo County is fantastic. I've done trials up here. It's a, it's a great mix of people with Yolo County being such a unique and varied uh, county. Uh, you've got the Davis, uh, UC Davis. You get students. You get teachers. Um, you'll get people from Woodland, West Sacramento, a great wide variety of people in, in Yolo County. I don't think anything needs to be done to change the pool in Yolo County. Um, I assume that some of them don't come when they get their notice, but uh, they seem to be cracking down on that recently. Uh, when we moved, we apparently I missed one and got a notice that it was going to be a warrant for my arrest if I didn't show up. So they're doing fairly good with it right now, um, and I think it's, it's a fantastic panel. I wouldn't do a thing to change it. The California Constitution demands that we have a jury that's comprised of a fair and representative cross-section of our community. And I think all of our courts, including Yolo County, do a tremendous job at making sure that statistically we do have a fair representative of our community when we come in there for the jury pool. But then what happens is we have hardships and jurors get excused for that. We have challenges for cause and jurors get excused. And then we have peremptory challenges by the parties. And before you know it, we may have a jury panel that is a cross-section of the community that is able and willing to serve at that particular time and not necessarily a fair and representative cross-section of our community. But it's the system that we have. It's a wonderful system. And we do hear about juries get it correct. I do agree that our jury system in Yolo County is good. Uh, we pull them from the places that we're supposed to pull them from, and we get a good cross-section of people on the jury. And if they do get excused for a hardship or some other reason, it's just part of the system, and our juries have worked well. Okay. Um, so now we go to Mr. Brennan. Um, the question is, if you do not technically live in the county, what parts of your life personally or professionally are connected to the county? Well, I live in the county, so I don't know how to answer that. Um, kids go to school there, I work there, I shop there, I, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> everything I do is pretty much related uh, to Yolo County, so. 
don't think this is probably the right question for me. Thank you. I do live in this community. I grew up in this community. As I mentioned before, I was educated in the West Sacramento Public Schools. My husband's been educated in the Davis Public Schools. Our children are attending school here. We live here. This is where we volunteer. This is where we give back to our community. And this is where we call home and have for many, many years. Ms. Baronia. I came to Yolo County 34 years ago and started with the court. I've lived in Yolo County and I live right outside of Winters right now. We go to the Winters Christmas tree lighting every year. We're part of the community there. I eat lunch every day in Woodland. I spend all my money in Yolo County. <laughs> As you already know, I'm a proud Aggie having graduated from the UC Davis Law School. But I'll tell you one of the things I'm most grateful for is the University of California Davis Hospital. My son was born at 24 weeks at the micropremie. He lived there for four and a half months. It was two months before I knew if he was going to live or die. UC Davis is my home. I lived here for years. I live now just 15 minutes from the Wooden Courthouse. I regularly am in this community through my practice, my economic life, which is another way of saying I spend my money here, friends, family, and the community. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Delaini. Um, so this is, there are several questions here uh, that have to do with AB 109, uh, split sentencing, alternative sentencing. Um, so I've tried to kind of condense this down into a question that you might ask uh, or may be able to answer. What role can judges play in developing or supporting alternative sentencing programs? All right, well, based on uh, the one objection rule, then I'll strike that question. Um, the other question um, was, please address diverting people who have severe mental illnesses from the criminal justice system. Yeah. Um, I think that we should have or should look at having somewhat, um, I don't know if we should call them specialty courts or things of that nature. We do have individuals with significant mental illness who come through our criminal justice courts and maybe it would make our courts a little more efficient if we had an opportunity where those were carved out and we had individuals there who could provide treatment and wraparound services um, and things of that nature that might be required for them. Ms. Barone? We actually do have a mental health court and Judge Janet Guard's in charge of it. So Yolo County is doing what we need to do to help those with mental health issues. For many years, too many years, we've had to lock them up and throw away the key mentality. Long sentences for relatively minor offenses. I, I know my time has not gone up yet. <laughs> <laughs> Our prisons have gotten so overcrowded that we've had federal court litigation and special panels of the federal judges to deal with the mental health care not being provided to inmates. People who may not have had mental health problems when they go in, have them when they come out. Prison systems are not designed to provide mental health services. We need to find alternatives, both on a budgetary basis and for a community-wide, how we can best serve our people, all of our people. It, part of it requires a certain amount of community will or decision. Where are we going to spend our precious dollars? Are we going to increase that budget, meaning more taxes? If we're not going to, how do we allocate the resources? But we need to find solutions because the prison system is not where we want to be finding treatment for mentally ill people. They need the proper treatment. Now it is. <laughs> Mr. Brennan. Uh, I agree the mental health court system is uh, fantastic. It's a, it's a good start. I think we need more help. I see it on a daily basis. A lot of my clients have mental health. A lot of the crime you see stems from mental health. Incarcerating them is not always the answer. 
they do need help. Uh, Sacramento's mental health court's fantastic. Uh, Yolo, I know, their mental health court is good. Everything seems great, um, but we do need more. The problem is, how do we get it? As Mr. Cohen said, no one's willing to pay more for taxes for it. What can the judges do? It's, it's hard on what you can do with the finite budget. So I think it's a good start. I think we need more programs out there. I, I don't think that just locking people up is the answer. Um, a good friend of mine runs the um, program down in RCCC, the Sacramento County Jail, and their wel welding program has had two people um, that have graduated from the welding program come back on a violation of probation. Two people in... in okay. Next question to Ms. Baronio. What impact has AB 109 had on the judicial system and the role of the judge? It's impacted Yolo County in that we are now dealing with a lot of people who would have been in state prison and they're now out on PRC, I'm sorry, post-release community supervision mandatory supervision or now parolees also come and are adjudicated here. So it's made our courts work harder because we now have a lot of work that we didn't used to have. It's made our jail fuller, so it limits us in our ability to sentence pr people, especially misdemeanors, because there's absolutely no room left for misdemeanors. Done. It's money. That's what the whole issue is about. The state prisons are overcrowded, and the governor's solution is to move lower-level offenders to the county jail. While the county jails may be a better environment for low-level offenders in prisons, now people who are convicted of misdemeanors, contempt of court, are in holding, pending the adjudication of the hearing, are overcrowded, and so now we're moving people into the community, some who are ready and some who aren't. But it really goes to this. You are an activist group. You are an activist community, and you have to decide, and we as a community have to decide, how are we going to spend our resources? Because that's what AB 109 is about. It's not a question of good or bad. It's about where do we put the money? I think it's significantly impacted every county in the state of California. Yolo County, uh, clearly the jails are much more crowded. Uh, the, the offenders that were going to state prison a couple years back now are staying locally. It's taxing the probation department. Um, it's taxing the jail staff. But as I pointed out, I think this, uh, Sacramento has set up a, a fantastic program that has, has seen results. Um, you know, in my opinion, the lack of education or the lack of, of education slash job is, is what's causing a lot of the problems. If you have somebody, you teach them how to weld, and that person can go and become a welder and work for 10 hours a day or 12 hours a day, doesn't leave much time to get into trouble. In you know, my opinion, that's why that program has such a good success rate. The welders are, they have a, a great program to help get them jobs after they're released with their welding certificate. Uh, they also are getting funding for a horse ranch. Uh, they'll be taking in the wild horses um, from... Ms. Delaney? I think AB 109 and the way it was rolled out, there's no question that it has burdened our courts, not just in Yolo County, but throughout the state. Um, our jails are crowded, and so it's changing the way we have to sentence and deal with offenders. Our jails are full of individuals who are serving long-term sentences when previously they were only meant for pretrial detainees or short sentences, but it's what we have, and now it's up to us as a community and the judiciary to get the programs in place to make sure that it does become a successful program. In Yolo County, we now have the day center where they're able to provide wraparound services to individuals, whether it might be a drug problem or a mental health problem or they may be in need of vocational training, and we need more services out there to make sure that AB 109 is a success. Otherwise, we will continue to fill our prisons with more individuals. Um, 
Mr. Cohen is the next. What methods do you use to discover your own personal biases? How do you address or change your thinking to eliminate these biases? We have two types of biases, extrinsic bias and intrinsic bias. Extrinsic bias is easy. We know we don't like somebody because of the color of their skin, or we know that we've had a bad experience with a certain type of person or a group, and we're aware of those biases. And when we're aware of them, we can work hard to put them aside and make sure that we absolutely bend over backwards to be fair. Intrinsic bias is like the subconscious. You don't know your bias. One of the things that the judges score programs do is they have a little um, online test where they show you <coughs> pictures of various people on the right side and the left side. All you see is their eyes. And you have to, with no more than one second at a time, press the button, do you like the person on the right side or the left side? And again, the left side or the right side. And what it does is it basically tells you as the answer, are you naturally liking better one group of people? <laughs> Mr. Rennett, thank you. Um, I think in, in my 20 years experience again, I think starting off as a DA, I had uh, a lot of bias. I, I had opinions of right and wrong and, and that if you were brought to court you did something wrong therefore it's my job to make sure you know justice was served uh the last nine years on the other side of it and dealing with with uh, the human aspect of it i think my biases have significantly been eliminated i think now i have the ability to look at both sides look at at things fairly and not judge somebody as a da or as a prosecutor you get the police reports that's all you know it's all you know you talk to the witnesses they, they reiterate what's in the police reports and you go off to court, you got your marching order. On the other side, you get to look at, at the human aspect of it. You see the people, you see how the crimes or what's affecting not only the defendants but their families, the society. Um, and I think in having that unique perspective gives me effectively eliminated all my biases. I think one of the best ways to get in touch with what your biases are and how you should or how you can deal with them is by getting involved. Being involved in the community, being involved with individuals from all walks of life. And I certainly have that experience through Sacramento City College where we have a very urban environment. Um, I've gotten that experience through working with big brothers and big sisters where there are children there who are a victim of their circumstances. One of the girls I mentored, her mother was in prison for murder. Obviously, that's something that I have take issue with, but she was not responsible for that. And so by getting involved with her and dealing with the more human aspects of it, it changes your views. Um, working through programs like Volunteers and Parole, working with pro parolees who have been through the system, it teaches you their perspective and maybe some of the causes as to how we get there, and it changes the way that you um, may, it just changes your perspective. Also at the Attorney General's office, I investigate erroneously convicted offender claims. All right, Ms. Baronio. I've spent the last 25 years being fair and unbiased. I listen to what people say. I don't pay any attention to all the other things that are going on other than what's in front of me. When you see someone that you might, might have a perception that he or she is a certain way, when you do what I've done as long as I've done, you'll find that that's not true. You can't pigeonhole anybody. Everybody's different, everybody has their own story. And you just need to sit back and listen, keep your mind open. All right, um, so that is it for the audience questions. Um, so now we're gonna go to closing statements. And I'm actually gonna give you guys three minutes each. And one of the things I'd like you to, <laughs> alive. <laughs> One of the things I'd like you to do is, uh, in your closing remarks, address the question of 
why you want to be a judge. Um, so we will start with Mr. Brennan and end with Mr. Cohen. I always get the easy ones to start off, apparently. Um, my, well, I'll try to address this in two parts. Obviously, my, um, my, well, I want you all to vote for me. I, I have the experience. I have the ability to be a fair and impartial judge. I have the experience that no candidate up here has. I've been in court on a almost daily basis for the last 20 years of my career. I was a prosecutor for 10 years, did serious violent gang cases. I was in a hate crime unit. I did domestic violent unit, a domestic violence unit. I've done every trial. I'm pretty sure I've done almost every trial out there. I've started off as misdemeanors. I've done um, DUIs, petty thefts, did juvenile law. I've done homicides. I've done gang cases. I've done sexual assault cases, both on minors and adults. I've done everything there is that we see in court on a daily basis that 90% of our courts deal with. When you all get jury duty summons, it's for a criminal case. Uh, most of them, there may be some civil cases out there that maybe one or two of you have sat on, but the majority of our court system is tied up and involved in the criminal justice system. That's why I decided to run for judge. Um, I've been doing this a long time. I was a successful prosecutor for 10 years. I've been a successful businessman for the last nine years, and this is where that has brought me, where this, all the experience I've gained has put me in the position to be the most qualified judge for Yellow County. Thank you. Some of the reasons that I want to be a judge is first and foremost, as lawyers, we have an obligation to improve our legal profession, and that's one of the things that I want to be involved with. The second thing is public service. That's what my life has been about. I've dedicated my life to community service through working with children, working with parolees, working through the school, um, working on the volunteer, or excuse me, the auction through our school. I currently co-lead a brownie troop where we are solely dedicated to uh, community service and serving our community. My qualifications for this position are unmatched. My experience transcends criminal law. My experience transcends the superior courts. I have practiced in criminal law at both the trial and appellate levels. I handle civil habeas corpus proceedings. I get involved in administrative proceedings. I handle writ petitions. Um, I practice in all of our courts. The bulk of my practice is in our higher courts, in the California Courts of Appeal. I've also handled cases in the California Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So my experience transcends the Superior Court. I've spent five years as a prosecutor handling trials. I've now spent five years as an appellate prosecutor handling a myriad of cases. I am also the only candidate who teaches and has taught for a number of years the rules on criminal procedure. I am the only candidate who has taught for a number of years the rules of evidence, and that transcends criminal or civil. I have also taught the basic concepts of criminal law, and I have done that for a number of years. There is not a candidate that has my legal research or my legal writing skills. That's what I've done on a daily basis for the past five plus years. There is not an issue that would come before me that I would not be able to figure out. I will have the moving papers from both sides to help guide me, and I will also be able to do the um, research to figure out what I believe to be the best and most reasoned decision is. I've explained I have deep roots in this community. I was raised in West Sacramento. My husband's family is also from West Sacramento. In fact, my husband's family came over here in the early 1900s and walked across the I Street Bridge to go and work in the rail yard every day. Um, we've been in this community for a long time. My husband has served this community through the Davis Police Department and the West Sacramento Police Department and as a veteran. We believe in this community, we're involved in this community, and because of my unmatched qualifications and ties and service to this community, I would be the best judge for this position. I've chosen to work in Yolo County courtrooms for 34 years. Day after day, week after week, that's all I've done is worked in Yolo County courtrooms. I don't know how anyone up here can say they're more qualified than I am. 
because I have extensive jury trial experience as a prosecutor, but I've been on the bench for 25 years. I've been doing what a judge does for 25 years. I want to be a judge now because it will give me the opportunity to do the few things that I have not been able to do as a commissioner. As a commissioner, I've been able to do most jobs that a judge does, but there are some things that I cannot do and I would like to do those. I have so much to offer. I am supported and endorsed by every single judge that works in Yolo County. And what you should know is that a commissioner is an at-will position, which means if I'm not doing my job, I don't have one. And yet, I've had a job for 25 years, and they weren't all these judges either. I've, had, I've worked under different judges. Every judge that's come through Yolo County has thought I'm terrific, has wanted me to keep working here, and now they want me to be a judge. So I do not know how anyone can say they're more qualified for this than I am. I'm going to stand up because the people in the back of the room haven't really been able to see us. I'm running for judge because it's the best way to serve the community and to protect children and families. As I said when we started, we have no family law attorneys on the bench, and we need someone with the skill, experience, and fortitude, that special something, to handle the family law assignments. But the people I want to talk to tonight are not the people who came from Ms. Veronio, Mr. Brennan, Ms. Delaney, or who came from me. I want to talk to the people who came here that are truly undecided. They're like, what's this about? Let me go see what these judicial candidates have to offer. What are they saying? We have something special in this country. We can talk openly about politics without fear of going to jail, without fear of being ostracized. I want you, the people who are undecided, to go home tonight, talk to your friends, talk to your family, your neighbors. Tell them what you liked. Tell them what you didn't like. I can take it. We can all take it. But have that discussion. Tell people what you heard. When you go to the poll, I want you to ask yourself, who on this table meets your needs who in this table is best prepared to serve this county for the next two decades? Who in this table is going to get your vote? And if you do that, that's all I ask of you. And thank you so much for coming here. You've spent almost two hours here. You've been a terrific guardian. And on behalf of all of the candidates, thank you for giving us your time and attention. And, and I would like to thank all of the candidates once again for participating uh, in this uh, Candidates Forum. I'd like to thank all the audience for coming out and bearing with us through technical problems. Um, and, uh, and thank you. It's not very often that we, we get a uh, open seat for, for judge and uh, get to truly decide uh, who will be sitting up on the bench. Um, I'd like to thank Davis Media Access for showing this. Um, they will have this posted online. Um, Hopefully they'll have it um, on channel, uh, what is it, 15, um, here in Davis. Um, and we'll also, once they post it online, we'll put it up on the Davis Vanguard website so everybody will be able to watch uh, this event. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do this uh, early on uh, was uh, the last couple times there have been judge races, uh, it's been uh, a little bit uh, difficult for people in Davis to come see. Uh, the candidates forums. Uh, so we wanted to make it real accessible for a large group of people in the community. So thank you everybody. <laughs>